Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And then he began to say, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This is the word of the Lord. Modern-day Nazareth looks nothing like the little village where Jesus grew up. Today, Nazareth has 80,000 people perched on the top of one little hill up in the northern part of modern-day Israel. But when Jesus was a boy, scholars say, Nazareth probably had about 250 people. So I was really glad when I read a few years ago that a group of Americans had brought some property inside the city limits of Nazareth had walled it off with the big high wall to sort of shut out the rest of this big city and let them recreate the village of Jesus' boyhood. When we saw it just last February, uh, we walked around among sheep and goats, shepherds looking after them. There was a Jenny there with her young colt. This little burro had obviously seen lots of tourists who loved to scratch him behind the ears or pat him on the neck had his little winter coat on, his hair just standing out all around his little body, and he wanted to be petted something awful. Uh, We saw a carpenter using tools common 2,000 years ago. We saw women weaving as they would have 2,000 years ago. A very significant place, Nazareth. We know that Luke, in writing the gospel we'll be following this year, is following the outline of Mark's gospel, He tells you in the very beginning that he's aware of these other accounts that have been written. And you can follow along and see that he's following the basic outline of Mark from time to time interspersing a lot more teaching materials, primary parables taught by Jesus. Yet, on this particular occasion, Luke has chosen to move this story about Jesus up to the very beginning of his ministry. Mark and Matthew, following that same outline, have this incident, but they put it much later, not so long before Jesus and the disciples turn south to Jerusalem where Jesus will be crucified. Luke puts it right up front because he wants this to be the announcement, the coming out, if you would, of Jesus to his own hometown, that he was not just the little boy they had known growing up, not just the teenager whom they had seen learning the skills of his father, but he was, in fact, the very embodiment of Almighty God, that God was in him in a way he never had been in anyone else. Things go well in the portion we'll be dealing with today. Things don't go well in the portion we'll be dealing with next Sunday. Let's take a look. First of all, this story, again, gives great importance to the Sabbath. I've been telling you that Luke is careful to point out that Mary and Joseph were observant Jews. They had Jesus circumcised on the eighth day. They took him to the temple for his blessing. They took him back when he was 12 and beginning to turn from being a little boy into a responsible adult, learning how to profess the faith of his fathers and mothers before him. Over and over, Luke will tell us that Jesus observed Sabbath. He observed Sabbath. Just two weeks ago, I was hosting pastors of some of our largest United Methodist churches in the country. We were just a few blocks away at the Ambassador Hotel. Our group comes from our largest church in Indianapolis, Denver, Colorado Springs, Dallas, Houston, Fort Worth, Little Rock, Wichita. 
we meet 24 hours. We start at noon one day. We work as hard as we can into the night. When finally everybody says, I got to go to bed, they all go to their rooms. We start early the next morning. We go as hard as we can until 12 noon. They catch all the shuttles to the airport and are gone. But they talk about things that are important in their own ministry. And one of the things they say is, nobody's taking care of our Sabbath. Nobody's taking care of our Sabbath. We who are older sit around the table and say, can you believe they're playing Little League games on Sunday morning? Can you believe they're having gymnastic tournaments on Sunday morning? Can you believe that they have soccer tournaments on Sunday morning and not enough people are complaining about that? When I was a little boy and playing Little League, one of the great all-stars was Hank Greenberg. Back then, you had to listen to the baseball games on radio. And my little part of Texas just sort of shut down when it was World Series time. And I remember hearing about one of my favorite hitters, Hank Greenberg. I had a Hank Greenberg bat way back then. And Hank Greenberg said, I'm not playing on Yom Kippur, even if it's the World Series. And I've never forgotten that. When we lived in Houston and our little boys were coming along, we had a wealthy man in our church who was part owner of the Houston Astros. He gave Dr. Charles Allen six season tickets to Astro games, four rows behind the dugout. And we all got to enjoy the ball games. So we were taking our little boys to the ball games before they started to school. And they were seeing Willie Mays, Sandy Koufax, one year, the Astrodome hosted the All-Star game. And that year, we had options to buy All-Star tickets, and we went. And now we got to see Mickey Mantle play, and we got to see Whitey Ford and Yogi Berra, along with the great National League players. But I was hoping my little boys would remember that the Dodgers got in the World Series, and Sandy Koufax said, I don't pitch on Yom Kippur, even if it's the World Series. Somebody has to say, no, that doesn't work for my family. Sunday's when we go to church. Sunday morning is when we go to church. Mary Lou Carney has written that one day she had her little three-year-old grandson. She'd look forward to it, she said, having this little fellow with me all day. But by late afternoon, I was really looking forward to his mother coming. I said to him, I tell you what, why don't we have some apple slices till your mom gets here? He nodded his head, followed me into the kitchen. So I washed an apple, and I began to slice, taking out the core, of course. And I put some slices on a little saucer for him and some on a saucer for me. And I helped him up in the chair, and I went around the table and sat opposite him. And he looked at me. I said, what? He said, I want to be by you. And she said, but you're just right there where granddad sits at breakfast and dinner. We look at each other. I'm looking at you. Hold out your hand. We can touch. He said, I want to be by you. She said, we only have two chairs in here. My chair, your chair. He didn't want to argue. He just slipped down out of his chair, heavy as it was, and started pushing pushing till he got it all the way around till his chair touched my chair he climbed up in his chair and with his arm touching my arm he ate his apple he just wanted to be near me sabbath is an understanding that at least every seventh day we need to be near him right? at least every seventh day these pastors were saying Every time we lose a member of the World War II generation, we have to win four new ones of this generation to have the same attendance at Sunday school and church. The World War II generation thought Sunday school and church happened every seventh day. And today we're fortunate if new members come once a month, once every six weeks, once every two months, they will tell you they're active. Can you build a Sunday school with people that come once every six or eight weeks? Could you build a choir that could sing like this one did a few moments ago if they all showed up once a month or once every six or eight weeks? No. No, you can't. 
Jesus affirmed the importance of the Sabbath. Number two, he also gave great credence to the importance of being in the synagogue, being in the church. And that's what we're talking about here. I've been telling you about Dr. Fred Craddock. He's one of my favorite people, of course, and Dr. Craddock has just retired for the second time. Until he was 65, he held a distinguished chair at our Candler School of Theology, Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Had first taught at Phillips Theological Seminary when it was still in Enid, Oklahoma. And until we Methodists heard about him and recruited him away from that wonderful disciple seminary to our Methodist seminary. And he had taught there until he was 65. He started having some health problems at that point and decided that he would retire from active teaching. But when his health got better, he decided he would pastor a little church way out in the woods for the rest of his life. But at 85, he decided, well, maybe this is enough. So he's retiring again now at 85. Dr. Craddock has written in one of his books about going to preach at St. Mark's Church in Atlanta, Georgia. He even names the church. I'd been asked, he said, to preach one Sunday for the pastor. He had told me that when I got through preaching, I should go to the main door. People would be expecting to speak to me as they left. So he said, I got through preaching, and I went to the main door, and I was shaking hands with people as they started on to lunch. I saw this young woman sort of standing back, not getting in the line. She just waited and waited till everybody else had gone. And then she walked up to me, and she said, Can you believe I'm 28, and this is the first time I've ever been to church? I said, Really? What did you think? She said, it was scary. Really, he said, what frightened you? And she said, it just seemed so important. I don't ever go anywhere important. I don't ever do anything important. Everything here just seems so important. Number three, he also affirms the importance of Scripture. Scripture. We Gentiles could learn much from our Jewish neighbors. The Sabbath again, how important it is to them. We were in Israel just last February again. The days are short in midwinter there as they are here. And so in late afternoon you could see people scurrying around trying to get everything done on Friday before the sun went down. You could see young mothers with a little one on either hand hurrying from the market to get home and get ready for Sabbath. You could see how crowded the buses were. They even have a light rail in Jerusalem now. People trying to get home from work before the sun went down. Two years ago for our Bart and Clinton Gordy series, we had Rabbi Zimmerman come, as you recall. And when Rabbi Sherman discovered we had Rabbi Zimmerman come, he had recommended him to us. He was very fond of him. He said, would it be okay with your church if we ask him to come early on Friday instead of Saturday and preach at the temple on Friday night? I said, our people would not mind that at all. So then he invited Gail and me to have Sabbath dinner with them and hear the rabbi on Friday evening. So we went to the Sherman home for dinner. It was beautiful. You've seen it in movies if you've never seen it in person. The women often light the candles, move their hands. Nancy did that so beautifully, lit their candles. Rabbi Sherman invited the visiting rabbi, Zimmerman, to break the bread. It's a beautiful loaf that Jewish families like to use on Sabbath if they can find in the bakeries. Here in Tulsa, where we don't have a lot of Jewish bakeries that they have in other big cities, there is a particular supermarket that provides that for them, a market here and they can go and buy that bread on Friday. It was a beautiful loaf. It looks like it's plaited. You've seen them. And Rabbi Zimmerman broke the bread and chanted for us in Hebrew the prayer for the Sabbath. It was very special, very special. But the Scripture is also very special to them, I hope to us as well. About eight weeks ago, Gail and I went again to Temple Israel on a Friday night We've learned what to expect now. We know sort of how the service works. We can follow along very well in the hymn book there. And there comes a moment in the service when the rabbi goes up to the ark. It's, it's a beautiful curtained area. 
and to push a little button and the draperies come back and as they part you can see Torah scrolls Torah and Haftorah Haftorah meaning all the rest of the Hebrew scriptures so Torah every Friday night and sometimes Haftorah as well these scrolls are very important to any Jewish congregation because though in the pew they have printed versions of the copies of the Bible these are all hand done all hand lettered every one of them the scrolls and they take them down they take the beautiful covering off the two scrolls and lay them down and roll roll to the point that they're supposed to read but then when the scrolls are taken up covers put on the rabbi and often the chair of their board would be similar to ours they start and as the instrumentalist begins to play they, they go up the aisle and people from both sections lean in some people just want to touch the scroll as it goes by others may have their program in their hand and I've seen them Jordan, just reach out the program and touch the scroll as it goes by and others just sometimes bow their heads and they go up one aisle and around and down this aisle. Everyone who weren't leaning in just to get close enough to touch. Up this aisle, down that aisle. Put it back. Draw the curtain. It's beautiful. The Bible's very important. Fred Craddock says he was attending a big international conference of Bible scholars out in Los Angeles. He really wanted to go because he had read that more than 3,000 scholars would be there from all over the world. Jewish scholars helping with the first 39 scrolls, Christian scholars dealing with the 27 others. He said they had speakers at breakfast and speakers at lunch and speakers at dinner and speakers in the morning and speakers in the afternoon, speakers at night. But these are Bible scholars and they can talk an hour and a half about why this word doesn't get translated better. This word doesn't mean exactly that. It means something else. And he said after hearing those kinds of discussions for 48 hours after one of the luncheons, he walked down into the lobby and he saw a young woman who looked sort of lost. She had a small zippered Bible in her hand. Dr. Craddock's a kind man. He walked over to her and asked, Could I help you? And she said, I've really messed up my life. I heard on the news that all these Bible scholars are in Los Angeles this week. I wondered if I could come in and listen. And Dr. Craddock said, of course she could have come in and listened, but nothing that was being said would have helped her. So I said, may I help you? I unzipped her Bible. And I said, let's look right over here. And I read a few verses to her, and I asked, do you understand that? She nodded. And I said, let's look over here. And I turned, and I read. I said, do you understand? She said, yes. I said, let me show you this part. Do you understand? She nodded, yes. I said, are you feeling better about this? She said she was. I said, let me write those down for you. You may want to read them again tonight. And I wrote them down and zipped them up inside her Bible and handed it back to her. Because you see, if somehow this book does not speak where people are hurting, where their deepest needs are, then we don't need to have another conference next year, he said finally comes down to this book being the most important in the world to us and that we understand at our deepest needs. Number four. We won't get to the village's reaction today. We'll do that next Sunday. It simply ends today that when they were all smiling, feeling good, about this son who's come home to their little village that he can stand up and read and do this so wonderfully well and then he said today this Haftorah from Isaiah has been fulfilled wow 
this is epiphany for us, the season when we thank God for letting us Gentiles in on his plan, that we get to be a part of the kingdom of God by trusting the grace of God that we've come to know in Jesus Christ. For us, the suffering servant is no longer the nation Israel. For us, the suffering servant, the reconciler, is Jesus of Nazareth. God was present in him, we believe, in a way never before, never again, except in him. Penny Schwab and her husband live in rural Kansas. A couple of years ago, her husband was having some discomfort in his chest. And lo and behold, on the 29th day of December, they had a terrible ice storm. Electricity went off. But they were supposed to see a cardiologist in Wichita on January the 2nd. So Penny said, we decided maybe we better try to get over these icy roads on January the 1st to be sure we're there. We called the hospital. Yes, we could check in the night before the test. So we checked in on January the 1st. That night in the hospital, the next morning, cardiologist ran the test. My husband had near 98% blockage in one artery. They thought in his age, all things being equal, he should have stents. And so they put those stents into the arteries around his heart, observed him for 24 more hours, and said we could go home. So Penny said it was my job to drive us home over those icy roads. And we got to our farm, no electricity. It had been six days and nights. We still had no power. I got him in the house, got the firewood, started the fireplace, got him all wrapped up, nice and warm. He said he was fine. I said, maybe the power will come on soon. Just after dark, she said, the lights flickered and then came on bright, strong. I gave him a little hug and said, we made it. He said, we did. She said, you know what I'd like more than anything else? A nice hot bath. Hanging around that hospital the last three days, I just want a nice hot bath. How long do you think it'll take for us to have hot water? And he said, our hot water tank is natural gas. It's been hot all this time. We just didn't have the power to get it to the bathroom. God's love has been from the very beginning. But for us Gentiles, a conduit, a source of the power to bring the heat, the warmth, the joy into our lives 